we all get a lot of rest last night? No. Good. Us either. Uh, this panel is, uh, hold on a second. The drawing ponies. Penciling picture perfect ponies. Uh, They're never perfect. With Tony Fleece and Agnes Garbowski. Oh, funny. That's what it says on the My, my program, because um, I get a write-up saying what I'm doing today, and it says, it says by Agnes Garbowski. And I'm like, ah! It's like this ongoing joke how I keep getting called Garbowski instead of Garboska. Because there's an A, but you pronounce it apparently like an I. I, I learned this. A's are pronounced like I's, guys. But it's pretty funny. I, I get Garbowski a lot. It's really funny that's on my paper, too. It's Garboska. Garboska. Tell your friends. Uh, so this is going to be sort of a loose uh, freewheeling panel. We'll just probably take questions. If you guys have specific, like, deep how do you draw, uh, you know, the inside of a pony's mouth or, you know, any sort of we crazy specific questions, uh, we can help you out with that. Uh, we're not set up on the AV, so uh, we may just invite people up here to sort of uh, draw with us a little bit. Try to, if I need to draw something, I'll try to flash it to everyone and be like, Picture. What I'm trying to say is uh, we have no idea what we're doing. Uh, <laughs> it's so, 10 a.m. So just hang with us, uh, and we'll try and uh, share some information with you uh, about drawing My Little Pony uh, in the comic books. So uh, I guess we'll just take questions. Does that sound all right? Should we should we introduce ourselves first? You guys, you guys know, you guys us, know right? who we are, right? We yeah. draw comic books. Oh, that guy doesn't know. All right. We draw ponies in comics. My name's Tony Fleece. Uh, I draw the My Little Pony comic books. I haven't drawn them since 2012. Um, uh, I'm currently drawing the, the main series. Next issue comes out uh, on Wednesday. Uh, the ponies are going to all turn into vampires. So you should probably check that out. Spoilers. Um, and this is Agnes. I, I draw ponies as well. Um, it just got, I just finished on the main line. And it just got announced I'm doing the Spike and Zakora issue online. If you guys haven't noticed, I draw all the Spike issues, eh? Pretty cool. Um, and yeah, and I might, might be back on the main line later on. But yeah, I've been working on Pony since 2013. I came on after issue six. Issue six was my first one, so I'm about half a year behind on schedule with Tony. Yeah. I think you caught up pretty quick. You're very yeah. fast. I'm a machine. I don't sleep. <laughs> so it's this wonderful thing called coffee. So anyway, that's what we do. Um, and I assume a lot of you guys are interested in drawing. Uh, otherwise, you'd still be sleeping. Uh, so we're happy to answer any questions you got about uh, comic books or how to draw them. Or, or our process or anything, really. Anything related to drawing the comics and drawing ponies, feel free to ask questions. Put up, oh, is that Mike? Are they supposed to come up to Mike or just put up their hand? I don't care. We don't care. We don't Anyone care. you want to ask your question, we are more than happy to answer all the questions. And it's good because we stalled a little bit while people are coming in because apparently they weren't letting a lot of people in until 10 o'clock, so we have a lot of stragglers. And I already see a hand up. Hi, sir. Uh, are they talking about books or? Um, I would say one of the biggest thing is is look at any art. Go to museums. Go to art galleries. Read a lot of books, not just comics. Um, even if you look up like a lot of famous painters, it's just really good good to get inspired by the masters. But if you're talking about books to read, I tell everyone, especially if you want to get into comics, Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. Read that book, especially if you want to learn about the process of laying out panels, pacing and timing, why you make a panel the size you make it. So Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. The next one I'm going to recommend, a lot of people especially are like, I want to draw ponies, why would I want to read this, is um, Drawing Comics the Marvel Way. The reason I recommend this book is it gives you a really good basis for drawing comics. You might not want to draw it the Marvel way, but check out that book because it also talks about pacing and anatomy. And even if you're really young, I tell parents, I'm like, tell kids to draw from life. Draw your parents, draw your friends, draw your pets, draw your backyard, just draw anything and everything. And my other recommendation is draw the things that are hard for you to draw. If you can't draw a person, but you can draw a horse really well, well, 
Start drawing people as well. If you can't draw boys, but you can draw girls, start drawing the boys. So whatever is really, really difficult for you to draw, practice that even more. I can guarantee you, the very first pony I drew, I would have not gotten in the pony book because it did not look like a pony. I'm not actually sure what it even looked like. So it's, I tell everyone, don't get discouraged if you can't draw something. Just keep practicing. Check out the two books I recommended, especially if you want to get into comics. Yeah, agreed. How to draw comics tomorrow, Wood. Uh, also, I would say if, if uh, academically there's not enough art classes for you, um, you, I would just set aside a couple hours every day or an hour every day that's just your time where you draw or you make art. Um, it sort of helps to have a structure um, and just say like, all right, well, I'm interested in art. Uh, every day after school, I sit down and I draw for an hour. Um, and whether or not you're doing like a lesson or anything like that, just the idea of having a set time where you sit down and draw sort of gets you in the, uh, in the mindset of doing it as a, as you're working at it, and the more you work at it, the better you get. It's all practice. That's the secret, guys. The secret is practice. I wish it was something more, but it's not. All right, question with the blue ears. Hello. Ah, Pinkie Pie. Pinkie Pie. Her hair just keeps getting bigger and bigger every time I draw her. I just, Pinkie Pie is my favorite, and I just love everything about her. So instinctively, anytime I draw Pinkie Pie, I go, everyone's like, wow, you drew that so fast. It's, it's, I love her. She's awesome. But for me, it's Pinkie Pie. What's yours? Uh, yeah, agreed. Pinkie Pie. Now, if you reverse that question, what pony is the hardest to draw, we have to say it's not a pony that's the hardest to draw. It's a pony's tail. We hate Rarity's tail. Yeah. It's so hard. Oh my god, that tail tangly. makes no sense. Yeah. And I still have to pull up reference. Out of all things, out of the main six, the only thing I need to pull up reference for is Rarity's tail. Now, now I did a whole issue with Rarity in the micro series, so I could almost draw it off the top of my head, but that entire micro series, I'm like, I just drew her tail and I forgot what it looks like. Oh yeah. Over here, this guy. Digital art versus traditional. Do you recommend going and drawing everything out first and then transcribing that to a tablet? Or do you recommend going and overlaying the tablet and drawing it out as you draw? Do you want to go over your process? Because that's a good way to go over yeah, it. Yeah, sure. We'll go over our process to show you how we do it. And then I'll go over my opinion over digital and traditional after that. We, we both have a pretty similar process where we do uh, our, we start digitally. Uh, so we have uh, a Cintiq, and we'll draw into the uh, into the computer uh, our layouts, which is basically like rough, uh, sketchy versions of what the panels are going to look like. Read the script, and then go through and do rough, sketchy versions of what the panel are going to look at, look like. And then uh, we print those out and uh, ink over them. Traditional. Traditionally, so it's sort of a, a half and half. Uh, there's really no good reason to to print them out and do them traditionally, except for that uh, we draw My Little Pony and that uh, sells, so it would be stupid to not have original art. Uh, but uh, if you're just doing like uh, your own comic or like doing like fast, fun comics, uh, doing them fully digital is, uh, makes a lot of sense. It's all preference and what you feel comfortable. The reason I still ink traditionally over digitally is my arm feels more comfortable inking traditionally. I love the feel of ink on paper. So I don't think I'll ever become a full digital artist just because I love the feel. And I still watercolor a lot of my pages. Like, if you look at my comics and you wonder why it looks like watercolors, it's because the shadows, like the darker areas, are actually watercolor. And then I do the final colors digitally. But whether you are a digital or traditional artist, I think every single person should have fundamentals in traditional art. If you're a digital colorist, you have to paint traditionally as well to understand color theory, to understand color layering, to understand why you might put purple in the shadows or why you might mix green and purple together to make, you have to understand color theory. So it doesn't matter if you're digital or traditional, I think every single person should at least have traditional fundamentals to understand why you do the things you do digitally. So. It shouldn't matter if you work traditional or digital, it's all just preference, but you should understand strong fundamentals in traditional art because all that is applied to digital art and actually makes digital art a lot easier if you have a basic sense of what you're doing. hope that answers your question. Um, I know there was a kid with the, yeah, the black shirt. Hello, I saw your hand up from earlier. Yeah. Do you want to come up here? 
right. Here, we're, we're, we're just gonna we'll sort of workshop through this and we'll show you guys what we're doing. Uh, but the pony heads are pretty, uh, there's a pretty basic way to do a pony head. Yeah. You want a pencil? You come on up. There's come on like up, join right us. There. And we'll show you everything that we're doing for him as well. We'll make sure to flash it up at every step. But it's just easier. Usually we have a projector, so it makes it a little weird, but every time we'll draw something, we'll put it up for you guys as clearly, and we'll try to draw. We wouldn't draw this dark if we were doing it ourselves. Usually you do very light pencils when you start off, but to make sure you guys can see what we're doing, we're gonna darken it up, and if you feel like you wanna move up a little closer, feel free to move up a little closer so you can see a little better too. All right, so like every how to draw anything book you've ever seen, when you start drawing ahead, you draw a circle, right? Can you hear that? That's crazy. <laughs> it's going to be really annoying. Uh, and then you uh, put a cross through it uh, just to sort of mark out. I'm pretty good at doing that part. I'm just not really good at putting hair on the pony. Okay. The ears and the unicorn horn kind of get in the way sometimes. Cool. Oh, then show, right, we'll, we'll get you show there. you how to position it on the circle. All right, so we got the circle here. For the purpose of this uh, exercise, mm -hmm. we're just going to put hair right on top of it. Uh, so you got your ears. The ears sort of sit back on the head like that, right? And who do you, like whose hair do you have the most trouble with? Uh, I don't really know. Rarity. You know, let's try rarity. Rarity's hair is a German. Okay. <laughs> Very difficult hair. Yeah. Um, okay, so she's got a horn. So the middle line, that's the center of the head. So when you add the horn, you always want to make sure you add it to the center of the head. So once you establish the center of your line here, we're going to draw it at a three-quarter look. So you just make sure to follow the center of the line. So if they have a horn, you make sure to put it in the center of the line, close to the top of the head. Right. Horn. Um, hair. Uh, and then with Rarity, her hair, when she has the horn, usually you cheat it to the left or to the right, depending on which side you're looking at, because her hair just sort of goes up and around the horn like that. So we're going to go uh, to the left. Well, I guess when I turn it around, it's going to be the right. We're going to go to the right. <laughs> I do Fluttershy's hair. Her hair is one of the super easy to draw. But I follow the middle line, and then I loop the hair over. And Fluttershy has a big loop, so you just make sure to go up and over to make sure she has that big bang hanging over her head thingy. So, see how you, since you drew the cross in there already, you've already got the, the arc of where the head's going. So you follow it back, the hair. And you can always see that since we're on the side of the horn here, you go around like that, and then down, and hang it down like that. We drew our hair, hair too big for the paper, so we're, we're going off. It's going right off the page. Um. But you'll notice also looking at Tony's piece in mind, so this line over here is the center of the eye. So we establish the eye line, and we make sure this way, we can make sure we center the eyes close to the middle of the face. But if you notice our ears, they also go down to the center of the line, and they're always at the end of the head. So we position it along the circle and then we both match it up to the eye line just because their ears do hang a little lower on their heads. Um, yeah, so it's sort of like thinking about it in a three-dimensional space. Uh, even though the ponies are flat, um, when they're animated, uh, the way that their hair sits on them is as if their head is like a, a round sphere. So it's just pretty much like you're taking the hair and you're putting it right on top. Uh, but it's bouncy and buoyant, so when you sit it on there, then it goes bloop. Like that. Does that make any sense? Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. You have to add the boink sound effect as well when you draw. Yeah, it goes boink. So I added lines, so I just went one step further, and you could see I made sure the eyes go on the eye line. They're centered on the eye line, they're in the three quarter perspective, and the nose is also in the, goes off the eye line, the middle of the head, because you want to make sure the nose. Wherever you establish, so if you move the eye, the middle of the head over, you just plan everything over to the side. If you move it to the center of the head, you just plan everything around the center of the head. So just use the cross to establish where the eyes sit on the head and where the middle of the head is. If that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, of course. Um, it's just we did slightly different angles. His is slightly more to the center of the head. Mine, if you notice, is slightly to the side. Because when you move to the front of the head, it does become a lot more square. So there's an example of the center of the head. The center of the head isn't curved at all because you're looking straight ahead, so it's less dimension. 
So I just curved her more to the side. Tony made it just slightly over. So the more of a curve goes to, so. If you're going even further off to the side of the head, you'll notice the curve gets even more extreme because it's right to the side of the head. And since the heads are round, you wanna make sure you follow the, con the contours of the head itself. Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, if your friend's on Twitter, you retweet them. If they're on Tumblr, you tumble them. If they're on DeviantArt, you DeviantArt them. I don't, I don't know what you do. <laughs> and hashtags help a lot, too. So, like, if you draw, like, Rarity, make sure to hashtag Rarity to get it out there more. So not only are you retweeting their stuff, you're making it more accessible for random people to find it. So that's why you'll notice we always add, like, MLP, Brony, my little pony hashtags, it just makes it more accessible for other people to find it other than your little, so if you have Twitter and you have 200 followers, if you hashtag it, not only are you accessing the 200 followers you have, anyone who searches my little pony will be able to see it as well. So make sure to hashtag and just keep reposting your friends stuff and encourage your friends to keep doing the same because the more people repost it, the broader audience you're gonna have and more people look at it so that way they'll end up getting more commissions, more people wanting to see their art as well. And just keep telling them, do it, you could do it. And just be very supportive. Yeah. Practically, uh, the best way to support them, though, would be to just actually support them. That's yeah. a, it's a tough racket. So you maybe money. just bring them food, money. <laughs> we like getting coffee at shows. Bring them coffee. Oh, yes. I have a question. It's about shading. I'm, I really, I want to try to do a game through different mediums, like markers, pencils. I really don't know how to shade that well. I feel like uh, all the shading that I ever do is sort of based on uh, like the, the shading that I would do with watercolor or with paints. Um, so uh, I would recommend sort of taking time and, and messing around with watercolor and sort of learning uh, the, the fundamentals of that, uh, like laying down layer after layer of, of, uh, of paint and sort of building up darkness and brightness. Um, that is transferable to every other kind of uh, coloring. Like even if you're doing it digitally or with marker or pencil, uh, the the fundamentals that you pick up through that through watercoloring and through painting sort of uh, go into every other uh, kind of shading. And before you start shading, you have to understand light sources. Where's the light coming from? The best way to learn light sources, which is the way if you ever go to art school, will be very, very boring lessons, but they'll teach you to draw circles. They're like, where's the light source coming from? Look at that circle and look how the light reflects. You'll mostly notice in the circle, there'll be the shadow, the darkest spot, but under the darkest spot, there's usually a, a highlight which reflects the light off the ground. And just look at simple objects, because the best way to learn how to shade is understanding light sources and how they act. So here I did a little cross hatching, which is a type of shading under her mane, because if you have a mane going over, that means it has to be shadowed slightly over the head. So I added very light shading, and I added shading to the side of her head, because that way it adds more depth. The best way to learn shading is just keep practicing. And I say start with the most simple objects, circles, squares, ovals, and look how the light reflects, and just practice, because the harder you press, the darker it'll get. And once you learn your medium, you'll learn how to control it. But you have to understand that medium. So using pencils to shade is much different than using a marker to shade, because marker you might crosshatch, but you have to learn how to crosshatch. Like I'm still kind of bad at crosshatching, so I don't do it very often. But it's just, once you pick a medium you like, watercolors are a really good one to learn shading and practicing, because you learn how thickly to apply it. But with anything else, it's the more you do it, the better you'll get. But understand light sources first, then start shading. And if it doesn't look right the first few times, just keep doing it. It's just, you'll learn to understand it the more you do it. Look at, uh, like, look at magazines, look at TV, uh, look at an actual picture. Like, if you're drawing a pony, look at an actual picture of a horse and see how light comes in one direction, hits it, and falls off, and is dark on the other side. And it helps also when you understand how the body works. That's why sometimes we say look at real horses, because once you understand the shape and the anatomy of a real horse, you'll also understand how to shade it, even if it's a simple pony form, because you'll understand the way the ovals work and what should be dark and what shouldn't be dark. Question. It's 
still basic shapes. I don't know if you want to come up here. I could. I, I remember Discord like 50%. You could feel free, and I'll show it to everyone else. But like everything else, it's figuring out the basic shape. So he has the top of the head where the eyes are, which is a slightly bigger circle. He has like a long oval shape that connects to a smaller circle. So, for example, if I've been drawing Discord, I start with a circle. So it's almost like the exact same way I start a pony. But Discord has his longer snout. So I would do another oval and then his, a circle to show where his mouth would be. So this is literally Discord's face. It's circles and ovals. But that way you can see he has the top of his head with his eyes, the long oval for a snout, and then another oval. And then you start filling it in. So you put his eyes in the loop. And then where I add the other circle, so I know that will be the bottom of his face. I can't remember his snout right now, but well, something of the sort. And then it goes back around. There you go. Thank you. So just build on the shapes. All the pony, even non-pony characters in ponies, tend to be uh, circles and then swooshes. Like literally. It's all, it's all circles and swooshes. But look, literally, you see where the circle was? You see where the line? I followed it, and I followed it all the way down. The oval became a little thinner, and then I added the, where the circle was, became a snout. So really, it's all basic shapes, and you just work with circles and ovals. And then his neck will be another oval and then you just start outlining it to fill it in. And then you could already see this is the center of the head, so one ear has to go on this side, one horn, two horn, and follow the ear. And look, the ears connect right back to the circle. So just work with the basic, basic shapes. Oh look, we got a camera. Hello, camera. Oh but look, this is really turning into a thing. Just work with circles and ovals. And once you learn the dimensions of this face, is that showing up anywhere? Oh, it is. So Thank I just you, work Chris. with circles, Ovals, circles, ovals. Every single thing is just sausages and circles. And then you just work it and fill it in and just look where your dimensions are. So you can see where the middle of the line, the eyes fall right on the center of the middle line. The ears meet right at the end of the circle. And I follow the little oval and just fill it in and just work it. And once you start practicing, you start getting the dimensions right. Like first you might be like, oh, I drew a snout way too long. Well, it's just so you can do whatever the heck you want. Anyways, but once you draw more, you'll understand how long you should make the ovals and circles and how big, and that just comes with practice. But just start everything off with circles. There's another circle. We'll go to Discord's little feet. But look, it's all ovals and circles. And you can already see that if I start filling this in, it starts forming a body. So just once you learn the dimensions, that comes with practice. But when you're laying out a character, it really helps establishing the center of the body with ovals and circles, and then start connecting in and filling it in. And the more you do it, the more it sort of becomes like the matrix. Like you just see the shapes in a thing before you even start drawing it. Now we have Discord. This is this horn, this is this horn, and then here. Oh, and his eyebrows. But I work everything around, circles, ovals, and just everything. I find the center of the body, center of the face, and I work with that. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Depends on the artist. How long does it take you to do a whole we're, book? Uh, we're pretty fast. Uh, like, it, if, uh, if we got our... <laughs> so distracted. Uh, we figured it out. We always figure it out. If I had my way, I'd have a whole month uh, to do it. And so that's like 30 days. Maybe I could take a Saturday off every once in a while. Um, but generally, uh, we, we knock them out in about three weeks, it seems like. Um, and that's all the way from starting the, the layouts and the pencils all the way through uh, sending it off to the colorist, or in Agnes's case, coloring it. Um, so yeah, it's pretty fast. But. Uh, like if you're if you yourself were making a comic and it took you you know like three months, that's nothing to be ashamed of. But my first comic took me like six months to make. So yeah, same here. I like all books start months in advance. We never start if the book's coming out in September. We never start in August. Most likely it's done already in Ju before July. Um, for me, I'm the only one who colors my own work because I'm insane. But I learned because I decided to get the flu during a deadline. Here's a fun fact: if you get sick during a deadline. The deadline won't get moved. You gotta get the stuff done. So I did pencil inks and colors on issue 30 and, dudes, my sweater's inside out. <laughs> 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 Sorry about that, but um, 
so tired I am. I didn't sleep much. Uh, I, was, I was doing commissions. But um, for me, I know I can get an entire book, Pencils, Inks, and Colors, done in three weeks, which I don't want to get done in three weeks because it's, it's really stressful and I lack a lot of sleep and my friends don't see me for an entire month. But it's a sacrifice I make because I've never missed a deadline. I'm, if I miss a deadline, maybe it'll be, might be by a day now, but they always give you a deadline. They say it's that, but it's really got a few days. But my preferred deadline, since I do pencils, inks, and colors, is I like having a month and a half. It makes it a lot less stressful and I could actually have an actual life. But um, it depends on the artist. Like, I know some artists that for them to do one issue can take them three months. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just the speed they work at. We are really fast, and that's why our editor loves us, because he knows that if he gives us a project, we'll get it done just like that. But it's no shame. However long it takes you, it takes you that long. The more you do it, the faster you'll get. My first comic for sure took me like over six months to do. But then the next one took five months, the one after that took three, and then two, and now three weeks. And then, oh my god, I haven't slept in three weeks. Yeah. Mm, good question. That is a good question. Uh, you want to come up? Let's draw some eyes. Yeah, well, drawing eyes, like you can already see that when we drew them, we always established the eyes on the plane. We make sure to establish it on the middle line. So if the middle line is higher on the head, the eyes are higher on the head. If the middle line is lower on the head, the eyes are lower on the head. The expressions themselves, <laughs> you're going to hate me for this, it's practice. But Tony is showing off a little bit drawing. Do you want me to hold it? It seems like we could put it on one of those mic stands too, right? All right, so let's do... Uh, some happy eyes and some sad eyes. Uh, it's just, it's, cartooning is a lot of shorthand. Um, like if you look at an actual sad person, their eyes probably won't uh, have, have eyebrows that point up in the middle, but for the sake of this uh, exercise, it's let's fine. just go Sell like this. So you, we got our center line, the eyes are positioned on there, and I'll go in and detail them out uh, once we get them going, but I generally start like this. We start with circles and ovals, surprise! Yeah. <laughs> Every single thing we draw always starts off in circles and ovals. And we're not even joking. You're learning that right now, that everything's circles and ovals. There's not a lot of straight lines and ponies either, nope. so there's rarely squares. Other comics have squares. Transformers have squares. But funny enough, when I started drawing my Transformer head, it started off a circle that turned into a square. I do Transformers covers as well. They're coming out this month. Um, so, sad. Generally, if I'm doing a pony that's sad, uh, I give them, I sort of push down on their eyebrow like this and make it like <laughs> uh, And generally they'll be looking down because they're thinking about some sad thing. Their friend said something mean to them or they lost their car keys. <laughs> and also look at your own expressions. Like look in the mirror. Look at the way your face reacts when you're sad. Do you find that when you're drawing expressions you make that expression oh yeah it must be the funniest the worst is when I'm working in public like for example I do a lot of my work at the airport especially layouts just because I like to be very efficient with my time so I plan out my schedule like if I'm traveling to a show the reason I take pre-commissions is because most likely I'll have a layover for like two three hours why not work in those three hours so I usually push my deadline so I don't sleep the night before a flight during layovers I do my commissions and on the plane because I haven't slept I sleep like a baby so but the funniest thing is when you're working at the airport and you're trying to make a sad expression, you look, start looking sad and you look over and you're like, why yeah. is that person? Oh, ha, ha, ha. It's like, see, so, yeah, we make all our expressions. I do. I look like a fool. The worst is when I'm angry. I'm trying to make an angry. I'm like, I don't think I make a very good angry expression. Oh, that's not right either. Yeah, I'm glad my back is to everyone else. I, I work in a studio with a bunch of other people, but I can tell if they can see my face when I'm drawing smiles, I'm always just like, <laughs> big, stupid smile on my face. Um, so there we got sad eyes, and when I draw them like this, it just sort of looks like a cartoon when they're when the lights go off, you know, and the eyes are just looking around, floating in space. Um, but the difference between sad eyes and happy eyes, almost in a turn of frown, upside down sort of way, is uh, instead of pushing down on the brow, you're pushing up on the cheeks. So. But the same thing happens to you when you smile, your cheeks go up. Yeah. So that still applies to ponies, just they go, they're more saturated when they're pushed up. See, I hope there's no one taking photos of this, because I can only <laughs> imagine online, Agnes did a panel. And then instead of looking down, you know, the ponies will generally look like 
like straight up and down. Uh, super happy. That looks like a psychopath poem. Uh, and <laughs> I do so many psycho looks on Pinkie Pie. There's a cover I did. I think Jetpack might actually have it. There's, I have the Applejack. I think Jetpack Comics has the other half. But Pinkie Pie, she's holding gummy. She's in this beautiful gown. It's inspired by an art piece, but her expression is like, it's the funniest thing. I did it on purpose because for me, sometimes Pinkie Pie just looks crazy. So I wanted her a little, little off on the cover, and it looked really funny. So she, she looked like a little psychopath. Cute psychopath, but psychopath. But you gotta admit, Pinkie is insane. You give that point of chain, it's all beware. Yeah, that's a killer. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm left-handed, so even with a camera up here, it doesn't do any good. Um, yeah, you can see the one eyeball. But look how cute those eyeballs are. I tend to cheat and throw eyebrows in whenever I feel like I need them. Uh, they do it in the cartoon sometimes too, so I don't feel too bad about it. Um, but as you can see, like sad eyes, push down, happy eyes, push up. And it is just thinking about like how do you smile? You know, your cheeks push up your eyeballs, or your brow pushes down your eyeballs. So that's that's eyeballs. Okay. Thanks. You bet. Closed is very easy, because uh, it's just like a football with some lines in it. Um, and I think, uh, unless you're thinking too hard about it, like I don't even know that they make sense when they're closed. Like, like could you, I don't know if you could animate it opening up and have it make any sense. Yeah, they don't make sense. They look good when they're closed, and they look good when they're open. In between, we're not sure what happens there. Luckily, we, we just draw them still, so we don't have to worry about that at all, ever. That's, that's animation's job. Um, yeah, see, here's... Hey, like look a, at that. You can see already the, the football-shaped oval. Everything's ovals and circles. Uh, then you open it up like this. Uh, I tend to sometimes, depending on how big it's going to be or how much detail I'll draw out like a skeleton underneath it even though it's feathers. Look at bird wings like really like if you're drawing pony wings look at bird wings because they do act a very similar like different but look how birds open up their wings and how they look when they're open and when they're bent. Pony wings since they are pretty much bird wings they flow the exact same way they're just simplified. They're very simplified bird wings, but if you look at bird wings and understand the way they move, it yeah, also help you drawing cartoon stuff. Because I tell every cartoony thing is referenced on something real, and you you need to understand it. Yeah, bird wings have the the large feathers on the outside, and then as they go in, they have the smaller, like the down feathers on the inside, and that's sort of what the ponies have also. Um, yeah, princess wings and regular pony wings, they all have slightly different designs. At that point, you just have to learn the design aspect of it and to draw it. But, uh, back left, back left, that was that. I'm not touching it. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, so anyway. Uh, do you have a more specific question about wings, or? Did that kind of give you a base? Because the, the tricky part is, so like you see these two wings, they have, they're, they're two completely different things. Like there's no relation one to the other. And so you want to figure out how like, if this thing folded up and wrapped around. Still wouldn't really make sense. Yeah, like there's no, <laughs> that's the magic of cartoons is that it, it has no, uh, like, while well, the stretched out wing is like a real wing, and the folded wing is like a real folded wing, it's like almost like they're from two different birds, or two different pegasuses in this case. Um, but that's just the way it is, you know, that's the, that's the horse we were given. So. Yeah, show, show. <laughs> the yeah, wings, the wings. Oh, yeah. all the wings the can sad show. wings, triumphant wings. And if you are looking to learn how to draw the wings by the style, like you're struggling with the style of the wings, if you're learning, there's nothing wrong to trace when you're learning. I used to trace Jim Lee comics to learn how to draw, but I didn't go to my friends, hey, I drew this image. I'm like, hey, I'm learning, so I'm just tracing this image. How does it look? But when you trace images, you learn the shapes and forms of the images that you're tracing. So when you're learning, I say there's nothing wrong with it. Just don't claim that you drew it. Just admit to everyone else, they're like, hey, I'm allowed to trace. I'm learning. And then 
you learn to mimic it and then you learn to draw it on your own and then you learn to draw your own versions of it. So I tell people like, if you're like, oh, I, I, I can't draw unless I'm looking at something, there's nothing wrong with that. You're still learning. Look at it till you understand it. And the more you draw it, the more you'll understand it. And then one day you're like, oh, I can draw this all by myself. So it's, it's just sometimes if you're learning the style of it, just trace it. But if you're learning the form of it, look at bird wings, look how they fold, look how they move, and you could really apply that to your own art. Yeah, and also if you're looking at, at like these sketches that we're doing here, it's, these are sort of like the first, you know, the first pass of what, when you're working on a comic, would be like four other passes until you sort of refine it down to the exact way you want it to look, you know. But it all starts with the shapes and the fundamentals. Arm's so hairy. Uh, that's disgusting. I'm like, uh, I'm like the late Robin Williams. Sir. Highlights? Uh, the hind legs. Oh, hind legs. Yeah, I got. Uh, horses, real hind legs. Yeah, I got beat up hard on the internet when I first started drawing ponies because I drew them way wrong. Like, I gave them knees. It was a whole horrible situation. <laughs> it was crushing. Uh, but yeah, they're just like regular horse legs, uh, or look at your dog's legs. Yeah, study animal anatomy, get your fundamentals in animal anatomy, then apply it to pony legs. You'll notice that once you understand the way it bends, you'll understand a lot better how to draw it, and with everything else, it's circles and ovals, still pencil. Yep. A pencil. Right. Yeah, the legs, uh, once you sort of figure them out, it's kind of great because there's so much, there's so many different shapes they can move into. Uh, just by way of having the joints like they have. But when I just start off everything, I start figuring out the shape and I start smoothing it out. They usually don't have a very long body. And you can see there's my ovals and I start working around those ovals. And the hind legs have, I don't, I don't know what you call anatomy parts, I understand them. Hawk. A hawk. That's what it's Thank called, you. eh? That's butcher and talk. I remember when I first started drawing ponies, I drew their legs too straight down. They're like, no, no, pretend they have bell bottoms. All right, so when you draw ponies, pretend they have, they're wearing bell bottoms. But you can see there's anatomy, like there's joints that connect it. So if there was a skeleton, they have their rib cage, their skeleton, like there's still a skeleton behind everything we do. But to understand the way you should bend a pony leg, you have to understand the real life version of it. So. And then my problem was when I started drawing ponies is I drew my tails too low, so everyone's like, their tail's coming out of their bum bum. So though I learned, and now their tails are a little higher up on their thing, so now they have an actual tail. But now they have their bell bottom legs, but everything was circles and ovals connecting to each other. Does that make sense? A lot of circles and ovals. And like I said, we keep saying steady and anatomy. We understand anatomy. We understand the way the body works. We understand where mus different muscle groups are. And to really draw any, any cartoony style, you have to understand it. So I love learning about anatomy. Some people don't, but I still say learn it. Learn it, do life drawing. Look at the way, if you have a pet, draw your cat moving around. Like, I don't mean like draw detailed drawings. Like, so your cat's walking, so you're like, so draw lines, like, like if the cat's moving. And then just to like, draw the cat in different, really, really quick. We call them gesture drawings, because they're literally really, really quick drawings. And just drawing really quick, your cat may be lying down. They might look ridiculous, but the fact that you're drawing your cat in different poses, you don't realize, but you're actually learning about the cat's anatomy. You're learning about when it's lying down, why its leg might look like this, and its head might be on its body. And just watching your cat move will actually help you a lot with pony drawing, because their joints are very, very similar as well. Yeah, if you look at a cat lying down or sitting down, you can easily translate uh, the way their body is shaped to the way that a pony's body is shaped. But yeah, the quick drawings, like the really quick ones, are called gesture drawings. You, whenever you go to school for life drawing, you'll learn about gestures and anatomy. Ears. <laughs> you remember about deadlines, yeah. and you get scared, <laughs> and you draw it. But you know, we get stumped all the time. Like sometimes I really don't feel inspired. I really don't want to draw a page. I might take like a 
quick five minute, just flip through other art books, other artists, or, or start watching a movie just to have background noise. Sometimes I move on to the next page. If I'm stuck on a page and I know I really, I'll just move on to the very next one because maybe the next one will inspire me more and then I'll go back to that one that I was stuck on. So there's no reason why you can't go out of order. I work out of order all the time if I'm stuck. So if you're stuck on one thing, put it to the side, start drawing something else. You're like, oh, okay, I got the flow going. Oh, okay, let's go back to this. Oh, I could do this now. So sometimes just step away from it and then come back to it. But deadlines. Yes. Yeah, sure, come on yeah. up. Was, That's a good idea. Why yeah. didn't we think of that? I don't know. <laughs> but like a lot of people come, I see it, this show especially, man, the kids here are talented. And there's a lot of potential. Anatomy, draw circles and ovals. That That's like the armor already see like, but you're already not bad. Yeah, you're off to really. an excellent start here. That's what's shocking about you guys, especially this show. You just have a very strong sense of what you're doing. Now it's just refining it and practice it. The more you do it, the better you'll get. But like right now, for example, your head is slightly larger than they draw it in style. So next time you draw it, you're like, oh, I have to draw the head a little smaller. And just, just practice. And when you're drawing it, start outlining it with, with a pencil and start drawing in the circles and the lines for the eyes so you can see where the eyes fit. And like, if you're drawing in model, the head, the ear usually sits a little lower on the head. So next time you draw it like, and just look at it, look at it, look at your drawing, look at it, look at your drawing, you're like, oh, that's higher, this is lower. Let me try that again. Like, oh, okay, that looks a lot better, but now the eye's a little higher, and that one's lower. And then just keep redoing it till you start getting the proportions, because once you start learning about anatomy, and then the ovals for the neck, ovals for the body, ovals for the legs, but your legs are almost in a good place anyway, so. But it's, at this point, it's just, practicing and learning, just looking at the model sheet and looking at what you're doing and comparing the two till you realize why the legs should be in this position, why the ears should be lower on the head. And at that point, it's just practice. Can you, if you try to think, is it okay if I draw it? I'll use a pencil. You uh, could erase it afterwards. If you try to think about it in three dimensions, um, when you put your shapes in there, it sort of helps to, uh, to dimensionalize it. I mean, I'm gonna drop her down a little bit here just to, You'll see it once his hand moves, what we're doing. Yeah. The, the pony body is sort of shaped like a, like a kidney bean. Uh, you're wondering what a kidney bean is. It's, it's bigger on one side, slightly smaller on the over, on the other side. There. But yeah. if you just think about uh, the volume of it and the shapes, it sort of helps to uh, ground the thing and make it seem like it's sort of like it's shaped the right way and like it's actually standing in a place. Yeah. You know? And if you're drawing Celestia or Luna, for example, you take that kidney bean and you crush it more on one side because their body has a stronger chest and a smaller bum bum. So it's like a crushed kidney bean. Yeah. It's just sort of, it's, I mean, the ponies don't have skeletons because they're cartoons, but if you sort of think about it as if you're, uh, if you're hanging the whole thing on a, on a structure, that sort of, it'll help you in the long run. You're welcome. And I love your ears. They're sparkly. We're doing pretty good on, uh, I need a second coffee after this, but probably think we're kicking Bumbo. Oh, yeah, you're doing an excellent job. I, I feel like an idiot because you can really talk to people. Uh, uh, on the end here. Yeah. Yeah, again, look, I mean, look at life, look at, look at uh, real, you know, places, real people, real horses, dogs and cats. The, when, you're, when you're doing ponies, especially um, because of the economics of the animation, there's sort of, uh, a lot of times it's just like a, a profile shot, you know, three-quarter shot, straight-on shot. So uh, oftentimes you're not doing like worm's eye view or from super high up or, you know, uh, and in the comics, a lot of times we'll find ourselves in positions where we have to draw some angle that just does not exist in the cartoon, you know? So we, so that's when you're sort of uh, looking at real life, uh, building, the, building the shape of the pony and then just sort of uh, abstracting it so that you can sort of move your mental camera around. But yeah, look at life, uh, build the structure. And 
practice putting it in perspective. So this is a one point perspective and a lot of the time you won't want to do this because a lot of time you want to go to your default. Well, why don't you set up that one point perspective and you know that the legs will always be on the same. There's your horizon, there's your perspective line. So when you're drawing the pony, you know all their legs have to sit on a certain line. So this is our line that we're going with. This is our horizon. So all our legs, I'm drawing boxes now because we're working in perspective, but all the legs have to sit here. So the back leg will of course be smaller. And since the upper, the more front legs are closer to us, they're sitting on a, close to us, but practice drawing is perspective as well. So you'll notice the body has a bigger chest and smaller bum bum. And practice cubes in perspective. Like when I'm learning, and this drawing cubes in perspective will actually force you to start drawing characters in perspective as well. So there's a cube up here. So practice your perspective, because just like anatomy, once you understand your perspective, you'll be more encouraged to draw it in different poses as well, because you're like, oh, I understand why the head should be this and why the legs will sit here. And it actually becomes a lot more fun for you testing yourself. So there was um, Kim Jong-yi. Kim jong He's yes. He had a really great lesson saying that his poses, whenever he starts drawing characters, he always lays them out as boxes. And then he starts filling in those boxes with the shapes. And maybe practice doing that. Start doing a perspective grid, draw some boxes, and start trying to put the ponies in those boxes. And uh, you'll notice that you'll be forced to draw them in different bodies, shapes, and you'll be forced to draw the front, you'll be forced to draw the side. Because if the perspective goes to the side here, and our box is to the side, well, now we have to draw the pony standing in a slightly different position, where here, the body's more compressed because the chest is facing more forward. Where all of a sudden here, we're gonna start seeing more of the body. And we still follow the perspective line. So try playing around with that. Put boxes in perspective and start putting ponies in those boxes because you'll realize that you'll start drawing the ponies differently and it'll be more dynamic for you because now you're not just drawing the pony facing straight. Now you have to draw the pony to the side. You have to draw the pony as an upshot, downshot. Just start messing around with that. Yeah, and it'll free up uh, what you can draw. You know, you'll, once, you, once you understand the, the whole thing, that three-dimensional perspective grid shape, you can sort of, uh, you can draw the, any angle of any pony, you know, from completely underneath it to far above it to, you know, six miles away. Me too. <laughs> We're also taught it. <laughs> so, uh, my question is, for someone who is self-taught and has very limited access to classes, professors, and things of that nature, can you recommend any books that would help in teaching foundational things of anatomy, foundational concepts of anatomy, gesture, and Andrew Loomis' books are pretty great. Uh, yeah, L-O-O-M-I-S uh, is a, they're like super old books, they're classic books. They just recently reprinted them though, so they're available. You can get them on Amazon for like 20 bucks a piece. Andrew. Uh, yeah, there's like a creative illustration and dynamic figure drawing. Uh, and you'll the see. Post Files books, those are really good because if you ever start collecting the Post File books, they're from Japan. They're not the cheapest books. Um, you can find a lot of it online as well, but. <laughs> You start looking at dynamic poses and take life drawing classes. Every city has life drawing classes. You just have to look it up online where they're being hosted, like where I'm currently resigning. I know every Tuesday there's life drawing classes I could go to for two, three hours and draw the model. Like there's some amazing artists, like I don't know if you guys know anything about comics. Let's put out the name Francis Manipal. He's an amazing artist for DC Comics. He is completely self-taught. He never went to college. And look where he is now. Jim Chung. Ten minutes? Okay, cool. He's also completely self-taught. All they did is they're determined individuals that all they did was draw 
draw and draw. They started taking life drawing. They started buying just a whole bunch of different mediums to practice. And the more you practice, the better you get. Try watercolors. You don't use watercolors? Well, you're buying watercolors. You don't use inks? You're going to go buy some inks. And buy the cheaper supplies. Like, my mom used to go to a dollar store and buy all my art supplies there because she knew I liked to draw. She, didn't, she doesn't know anything about art. She's a computer programmer. But just because she didn't know, she knew how passionate I was. So she went to the dollar store. She's like, oh, that looks like something she might like. Oh, so if you're a parent and your kid draws, literally just keep buying them art supplies and paper, and they will take off, I can guarantee that. But post files books, go to a net, if you have life drawing, go to life drawing, draw from life. Literally, you might look like a creeper, but sit on the bench at a park and just start drawing. I, I don't recommend drawing people's kids because that might creep the parents out, but literally, you see a guy walking home from work, start doing like those really quick, like five second drawings just to understand the way his body's moving. So like, for example, if someone's sitting with their hands up, I start drawing, and just really quickly, I'm drawing them with their hand up, with their face, and there's a person beside them, they're sitting on, and just start drawing really, really quick gesture drawings just to understand the body. The moment you understand the body, it makes your life so much easier when you want to draw people, draw horses. Like, that's why I keep saying draw from life, draw your pets. So if you're self-taught, you're doing more of that, but school, what it does for you, it forces you to learn these things, whether you like it or not. If you're self-taught, you have to force yourself to learn these things. Now, I'm gonna say this with parents. Google with your kids, but Google is the greatest thing you guys have right now. You could Google so much anatomy, but parents, please Google with your kids, because no matter how much safety you have on your computer, there's weird stuff on the internet. But if you're an adult, you're, you're okay. You, 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 can, you might not be able to unsee what you see, but. Well, there's also, uh, I mean. So scary. If you're teaching yourself to draw now, you have sort of a benefit that we didn't have in that there's tutorials all over oh, YouTube. Over. Like you can just art has so many yeah. of them too. Just you can just fire if you say you're sitting around and you've already watched enough ponies for the day, if that's such a thing. Uh, and uh, and you you have a free hour, you can just fire up a tutorial about life drawing or about perspective and, and sit there and even if you're not, you know, uh, engaged completely just having it on and sort of hearing over and over the fundamentals is you know yeah yeah, yeah. for sure so yeah try and yeah try and uh, keep yourself engaged yeah the post files the Japanese those uh, I think it might be called dynamic figure drawing I don't know I'll look it up while we're talking and Google, Google, what books should I learn for anatomy? Oh my gosh, they will give you a list of books you should, you should check out. And it's all preference, like just because you buy one anatomy book, oh, I have the same tights as you. <laughs> I wore those on Friday, I love your tights. All right, so I think we only have one or two more questions left because we've got our 10 minute warning, so pick whoever you want. Go ahead. I got excellent. Yeah. I got excellent news for you. Is that uh, there's no actual supplies that you need. No. Like if you have a piece of paper, or if you have a computer, uh, like the supplies don't make that much of a difference. I have stuff that I like to use, but if I uh, ended up, you know, like stuck at my uncle's house and he just had, you know, like typing paper and and big pens, I could still do my job because it's just about uh, the actual. Uh, like what you, like knowing how to draw and the actual uh, movement of the arms and, so, and yeah. stuff like that. So like comic book paper? Blink.com. It's Blink, right? Or Blink. 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 Yeah, you can go on Blink.com. Blink.com is a great, they have so Get the many Katie coupons. Cook paper. Yeah, Katie Cook paper is awesome. Yeah, it's Blink.com. Uh, yeah. Katie Cook is on the cover of, I think it's like Canson paper. Or I can't think of a good yeah. Blick.com. Yeah, and they usually have coupons. Like, literally, if you look at the coupons, sometimes you just have to spend a certain amount. I just stock up on supplies when I order, but because the, I have only one art store by me, and they overcharge everything. I'm like, I'm not, if I could buy this paper for five bucks, I'm not buying it for $10. I'm sorry. I'm just going to go online, order it online, use my coupon. I love coupons. But, um, we're artists. We like coupons. 
but yeah. The Andrew Loomis book is a uh, figure drawing for all it's worth. It's excellent. Figure drawing for all it's worth. All right, quick question. Perspective. And when yeah. I draw dynamic poses, I literally do this. I draw boxes, or is this? I draw boxes to figure out how the character fits in perspective, and that's the best way to start figuring out a dynamic pose, is figure out the shape that you want it, figure out the perspective, and then start filling it in. So what I was doing earlier with the boxes, that's literally how I start any dynamic pose, up shot, down shot, the legs near me, there's a lot of boxes in perspective. And Google Dynamic Poses, and it'll give you some awesome tutorials too. Yeah, sort of think about your camera, you know, like uh, when you draw, your your mind is your camera, and you're sort of moving it to where, where like the best shot is. And so, say uh, you're drawing a can of Red Bull, right? Like from right here, just a can of Red Bull. But if you want like a dynamic superhero can of Red Bull, you take your camera, and shrink it down and put it like right here, and all of a sudden you have like a monolith skyscraper can of Red Bull, you know? So if you just think about, so if you're drawing Twilight Sparkle and she's here, uh, and you have your camera here, then it's just a shot of Twilight Sparkle. But if you go down here, then here she is and she's towering over you. Or if you go from over here, you can sort of start to move like this. I don't know if it's just, I don't know if it's just me because it's sort of intuitive, but you sort of start to see how your, uh, like how your shot, uh, like what your best shot is, you know? You need to think about that more and more. Uh, let's do two more. All right. Is that okay? We have three minutes left, so let's shoot out. Let's okay. Two more. We'll speed round. Sir. Yeah, I mean, I do it too. Uh, luckily, I can sort of adjust stuff digitally when I'm, when I'm working. If something's too big, I just sort of cut it out and shrink it down a little bit. Or if you're doing it on paper, you're just working with a pencil. If you draw one circle, you know, don't, don't be afraid to draw another one. Don't be too heavy with your pencil because nothing's permanent until it's permanent. You know, nothing's really permanent until it's sent in to the editor. Yeah, and when you're, um, if you're self-taught, for example, when you're in school, you learn this. Like a lot of people, when um, they're teaching you about how to draw a human face, there is like Ugh. the eyes, the distance from the mouth, there's a theory behind it. Now you literally can go online and say fate, um, human face anatomy, and it'll tell you the perspective of how far the eyes should be from the nose and how the mouth sits. And there's a theory to everything. And just go online and say face anatomy, horse anatomy, and it'll start telling you why everything's the way it is. Now, if you're drawing on model, for example, that is literally look and draw. And like I was telling the little the girl earlier with her ears not being on the right, you look at the model sheet, you look at your art, you're like, what did I do wrong that doesn't add up? So I drew the head here too big when the head here is smaller. So next time I'm gonna draw it, I'm gonna draw the head smaller and look at it again. It's still off model, but what did I do wrong? I'm like, oh, this leg is way too long. All right, let's go back and redraw it. So I'll keep redrawing it till I hit that model sheet. Now it's instinct because I draw ponies every single day and I stay on model as I can, but that is literally trial and error if you're drawing on model. If you're trying to learn how to draw real life perspective, go online, um, look at just the theory behind it because like the body, how long our bodies are, there's a whole theory behind it in our head, in our body. Like our body is a certain amount of heads. I forget now how much it is because it's built in here. Seven. So, so your, your body's like seven heads. And if you look at that online, like literally Google human anatomy and they'll have pages and pages telling you how long the arms should be, how long the legs should be, and just look that all up online. So I'm gonna go to blue hair because her hair hand was up forever now. Um, you're gonna hate me. Practice. <laughs> um, let's see, but when you like, you know how I keep telling you with the ovals and the neck and the body and how it works. You literally start outlining the ovals, and once you understand like how thick or how thin the neck should be, you literally the main is like a giant like connection. I'm sorry, I don't know the lingo, but what what pennies? 
above the neck? Yeah, like the, how the hair, if they have really short hair, how it sits off the neck. But you have to understand first the way the neck shape is for the hair to how it sits. But it's like literally a, like this is my mane, and it's a short mane. I, I can draw it, I just can't explain what the heck I'm doing. But I drew the oval for the neck, oval for the head, and I literally drew like a crescent for the head. And once you understand how the neck should look, so a, draw a pony without hair at all, and then literally attach it, like attach the bottom of the hair, the top. For me, a lot of the time, I draw like a weird shaped rectangle when I'm trying to figure out how it sits. So all my ponies almost always start off with a mohawk if their hair is short. So now, if this is Doctor Who, so I got my crescent that sits on the top of the head and sits on the neck, and then for Doctor Who's, I'm like, oh, okay, and there we go, now we have Doctor Who's. And it still was that mohawk shape, and that's a lot of the time when I draw short hair, almost all of it starts off in a little curved mohawk, little crescent moon that sits behind the head. And with ponies, almost all the time, their hair sits over their ears, so it's a lot taller. So I just draw big crescents, and if it's Doctor Who, if it's a crescent, it becomes a pointy head, pointy hair. Does that kind of make sense? But yeah, you just have to understand how the neck and the pretend that ponies have no hair, and once they look good with no hair, then it's a lot easier to put hair on them. One more. Um, we're technically over, oh, but we're, we'll done. Take, we're done. We're done. Oh, they cut us off. Thanks, Thank guys. You guys.